Let me just quickly describe how this is going to go. Um, in a few minutes, in a few seconds, I'm going to have Jeff Dyer uh, introduce the proceedings. We are going to, in the spirit of Jeff's remarkable book, Zona, uh, we are going to uh, sh look at the film for a while, stop, talk about it, digress, look some more, stop, digress, and so forth. Um, <laughs> So it'll go like this. He, uh, we'll, uh, he will talk for about 15 minutes at the beginning. We'll show part of the film. We'll, around half an hour into it, we're going to stop, and you'll meet the panelists, and, and they'll start talking a bit. We'll go on until the end of part one. At that point, we'll take a break, a 10-minute break. One thing about this break, by the way, uh, and those of you who are familiar with our events, we have an independent bookseller out there. We have books of all the panelists. These are terrific books. American civilization will die <laughs> if you don't go and buy books. We also, by the way, have uh, copies of Stalker and The Mirror and The Sacrifice, DVDs. And you will die if you don't buy those. So, so you know, that's simple. Anyway, uh, we will then reconvene after a short break. We'll, we'll show, at that point, part two is a bit longer than part one. So halfway in the middle at, at the point, place of Jeff's choosing, we'll stop there and talk a bit more. We'll talk a bit at the end. And by that time, it'll be getting close to 9 o'clock, and you will be released. Uh, uh, but anyway... Uh, I, I want to thank the people here at the New School. Uh, thank Stephanie Steiker, my assistant uh, and associate, uh, who does all the all the hard heavy lifting right over there. And now I want to introduce my my great great friend and and uh, fellow mischief maker uh, Jeff Dyer, the award winning Jeff Dyer, uh, who will explain what we are up to today. Okay. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm having the most sort of extraordinary time in New York, and I spend, spend I seem to spend all my time either here or in the Cafe Loop over the road. It's the most restricted visit to New York I've ever had. Uh, but this afternoon will be one of the most expansive um, uh, experiences. And also, I think it's worth saying this is a, a unique, um, yeah, it's a, a unique way to see Stalker. Unique in the sense of potentially uniquely irritating. Uh, for those, especially for those of you who've not seen the film before. So I guess this will be quite useful uh, for, for me and the panelists. Could you put up your hands if you have seen Stalker before? Um, okay, now, now, because I seem to be rather, I've, like I've had a stroke or something. Who, who, who has not seen it before? Oh, it's... It looks to me it's absolutely 50-50. That makes life easy. <clears throat> um, so just to explain a, a few things uh, about it. Um, obviously, one of the, for those of you who haven't seen the, the, the film before, um, it... It does not move at the pace of a James Bond film. <laughs> and uh, that's a good thing because, I don't know, I think I'm probably speaking for many of us. I mean, in my view, there is nothing more boring than a James Bond film. Uh, but the thing is, I think, uh, if um, the key thing is to give yourself to the time of the film totally. Uh, because actually, if there is any kind of feeling for any sense of boredom, that tends to be a product, not, a, not so much of what's happening on screen, as it's more a kind of friction between your expectations of how you want a, a film, to the speed at which you want a film to proceed at, uh, and the way it does. But actually, you're not going to have a chance to get bored because of all these interruptions that are coming. Um, <clears throat> we're going to interrupt it at the first point at a um, we've chosen the, the point at which we'll first in interrupt it very, very carefully. Uh, so if you do feel a sense of frustration at that moment, uh, don't, don't worry, because it will be more than compensated for by the way that we, uh, we resume sh showing the film. Um, we are showing the film <clears throat> um, from a DVD. Um, now, those of you... Ren is 
somebody who is occasionally prone to exaggeration, uh, but he assures me that there is no print of Stalker available in the, on the North American continent, in either the USA or Canada, which is kind of horrible state of affairs. Um, but it doesn't entirely surprise me, because when we were trying to get the, um, the image for the cover of the book from, from Moss Film, that was proving to be really, really quite tricky. I thought it would be straightforward. This is, you know, Russia's many ways has sort of embraced capitalism, and this was a, a chance to get money. It, it involved getting the, the right, getting an image and the rights for it. It was like we got sidetracked into a kind of John le Carre uh, novel. And I promise you, this is not an exaggeration. We had a mole in Moscow who had some sort of in with Moss film, and we had to send her an odd number of red roses. <laughs> this is just to get a, a, a high-res a high image for the cover. So uh, I, I, if I understand things correctly, uh, there, the, the film is just in this weird sort of limbo at the moment, that there is no kind of distribution deal uh, available. And actually, the situa although there are prints in Britain, um, it's, it's similarly in, uh, in this kind of weird, uh, weird limbo, which is a great shame because it means we're missing out on what we call in the trade cross-marketing opportunities. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, so Stalker was made in, in, in 1979, and uh, I saw it, when it uh, on release when it came out in Britain in 1981. So I saw this film 30 years ago, and the reason that um, I wanted, that I ended up writing a book about it, well, I guess the, um, I had in the back of my mind this, a few lines of J.M. Kurt Sears when he's talking about having read certain lines of Dost certain pages of Dostoevsky innumerable times, and still he finds that he, instead of becoming inured to their power, he finds himself sobbing uncontrollably. And for me, something similar happened. In the, although I'd seen this film more than any other film except Where Eagles Dare, um, I found that I, I still found myself overwhelmed by its power. Uh, it, it increased with every, with every subsequent viewing. Uh, it seemed more and more profound. And I also came to realize how, how it had shaped my, my view of the world. I think you'll all be familiar with that thing. You go to see a film, however crap it is, and for a, a few seconds you get outside of the, the cinema and the world is, you know, uh, you're seeing the world through the eyes of the, as though, as though you're in the film that you've just seen. Now, with really bad films, it only lasts a couple of seconds. With, um, with, uh, uh, with other films, I'm thinking of that film that I saw recently, whatever it's called, Marcy May, oh, I can't remember the title. Um, that, that lasted for me for a long time, uh, but, uh, but Stalker has lasted. It's, 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 um, it's changed the way I've seen the world for, for, for approximately uh, 30 years, and I, I think that's, uh, that's not unusual. Just a few very quick things about the, the, the history of the making of the film. It's not unusual, I think, for these great masterpieces of cinema. They tend to have uh, rather troubled creation stories. So I think many of us will have seen the documentaries made about the making of Herzog, Herzog's Fitzcarraldo or Coppola's uh, Apocalypse Now, you know, productions which um, really, uh, you know, both of those films came close to not being made. And in the case of Stalker, I mean, it's, it's interesting, I think, as we were very fond of saying in the, in the 1980s, on the one hand, we like to see Tarkovsky as this persecuted, Tolstoyevsky type of Russian artist persecuted by the system. But of course, as we like to say back then, a much cruder form of censorship operated in the West, uh, the form of censorship known as the market. I mean, it's quite hard to believe, really, that somebody could have got the money to make films like, could have raised the money to make films like uh, Mirror or Stalker. Uh, but get the money he did, and uh, half of the, half of the, I think half of the budget was used. They'd shot half of the film in, um, in, in Tallinn, in Estonia, and the director of photography, George 
I'm not, I, forgive my pronunciation, Georgie Rehberg, um, who, who had you know, done such brilliant work on Mirror, uh, something happened. There's all sorts of accusations on st or, or about whose fault it was. Either he'd done something wrong or the technicians processing the film but back in Moscow. But anyway, uh, the whole of the, it was all, it was all completely ruined and, un, and unusual, un, unusable. So a complete disaster. Um, and it looked like at that point um, that the film would not be made. Um, but as can happen, that delay proved to be absolutely crucial for the film becoming this great masterpiece that, that, that we're familiar with now. Because it was during that delay that Tarkovsky completely reconceived that the central character of the stalker. Uh, first time around, as I mean, much closer to, to, to the character in the short story, in, the, in, the, in the, the short novel it was based on, some kind of hustler, or Tar Tarkovsky used the, used the word like a, a bandit or a drug dealer, and as you'll see, uh, those of you who've not seen the film before, he's transformed into this, this rather tragic apostle or uh, absolute believer in the zone. And that's so, I mean, it's almost inconceivable to us now that the stalker could have had some, some other kind of character. They managed to come up with some kind of way of, of, of getting some, some, uh, some more money. Uh, the film, uh, Rayburg, um, again, depending on whose account you, be you believe, he either just stormed off the set or he was sacked by Tarkovsky. Another director of photography came in and again he was either sacked or ra ran off. There's a, you know, you can read a, an account of all of this stuff in, in Tarkovsky's diaries. And and eventually they got a third DP uh, um, on board and, and it was finished um, again. Uh, so it's, uh, it was the last film Tarkovsky made in, in the Soviet Union. And for my money, um, but please, you're not allowed to throw things, it was the last great or even, I think, yeah, it was the last great film Tarkovsky made. Um, as always happens to any distinct stylist, uh, it seems to me, and actually to uh, to Bergman and Wim Wenders as well, that the two two films he went on to make in the West, uh, Nostalgia and Sacrifice, they were they had they, 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 it felt rather rather uh, self parodic. So, in other words, what we're seeing, I think, is the absolute sort of the triumph of, of Tarkovsky's work and. Um, you're dying for the film to start. So, um, uh, so uh, it, it, in, enjoy. Thank you. Okay, I warned you that you might find that a little bit uh, irritating, but I think you'll find this next part extremely stimulating. Um, I'm gonna just say something uh, very, very brief that uh, weirdly, I'm not, I'm not even sure this is true, but it seems to me I'm watching that the, the subtitles are slightly different to the to the version that uh, that I have that I've been watching in England. I don't know if such a thing is possible, um, but it's uh, well that will I think that will be revealed perhaps later on. But it certainly seems a bit different to the to the to the way I remember it. But now I'm going to hand you over to uh, to this lot. Who would like to go first? Um, I was just, I was struck by something in, that you mentioned in the book about the, um, the, the way the film begins. Um, and uh, after the, the people at Moss Film had seen uh, an early cut of the film, they uh, kind of uh, wanted to encourage Tarkovsky to speed it up a bit. Um, and he, he, uh, felt that this uh, wasn't, wasn't helpful, and they said, well, we're just thinking of the audience. And um, he, this got him even madder, and he said, the only audience I'm interested in is Ingmar Bergman and Robert Brisson. <laughs> um, but then he said, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna make it even slower, uh, so that if anyone walks in accidentally, and this isn't their kind of film, they can get up and leave, uh, and then we'll be, be you know, good riddance to them. And uh, this, this struck a chord with me because we had exactly this discussion, except the capitalist version, uh, when we were making the conversation, uh, which was 1972, 73. Um, and we, uh, would screen versions of the film. It was never previewed in any uh, official sense, but we had screenings for 
uh, a number, uh, you know, five or ten people, and there was always this, can't it get going a little faster? Because Francis had just had a huge success with Godfather, and uh, Gene Hackman was in the film, and it was just after Watergate, so people were expecting um, Popeye Doyle meets the Godfather in the Hotel Watergate. Um, and so we tried, we, we did, unlike Tarkovsky, we actually tried to speed it up, and, but we learned what he uh, learned, which is that if you do that, you then deliver even the r more wrong audience to the heart of the film. Mm -hmm. And so we, we discovered that uh, that was not the way to go, and we, just like Tarkovsky, we, we put it back th the way it was originally, uh, which is the way it is uh, now when you see it. Uh, it's a slow, measured beginning, but it just, it's just, it's something to, to talk about with uh, this kind of very unusual um, um, measured pace of, of the film. Um, what is the filmmaker trying to say, and whether you agree with that or not, uh, the beginning is how you get in. That, that's how the needle kind of gets under the under the skin, and the, then the, the plunger can deliver whatever the film has to, uh, to deliver. Uh, thank you, Walter. I wanted, I wanted to say a few things. One is that uh, Tchaikovsky was, was not alone in, in, in uh, Soviet Russia uh, in some of this uh, uh, aesthetic tendency. Uh, we think of him as a kind of lonely comet, you know, but uh, uh, you had a whole bunch of filmmakers uh, like uh, Alexei German, whose, whose uh, beautiful films will be seen next month at the Walter Reed Theater in a retrospective. You had uh, Larisa Shapitko, Ivan Klimov, uh, Parajanov, uh, and they were all uh, drawn to this long duration take aesthetic, uh, which seemed to be a way for them to escape socialist realism uh, and find something more spiritual or more allegorical. Uh, it's interesting to me how, how the long duration take became a kind of uh, international uh, art film festival style and, and, and uh, the different uses to which it was put, like uh, the Greek director Angelopoulos, uh, I mean, uh, Antonioni, Bresson, um, and uh, Janschko, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, you, in your book, you, uh, you uh, depart from some of them and like others, you know. Um, but uh, it, it, what, is the, what is the advantage of this detention, the long duration take? I think it sort of plunges you into the, into the moment, uh, and uh, it doesn't guide you in the way that a lot of quick editing and, and, and music over the soundtrack guides you. So you're, you're, you're thrown back on your own resources. Uh, that's, that's, that's part of what happens with, with long duration takes. I, I was struck this time watching it how much, how much tension there actually is, how much argument, how much um, um, contempt, uh, bullets flying. It's not as though uh, uh, nothing's happening, you know, quite, quite a really, bit is it, happening. It really is. I was struck by how incredibly exciting it yes. is. That, that, yes. Yeah. So first we tell everybody nothing happens, it's very dull, and then right. the bullets start flying. <laughs> it's quite a bit like James Bond. <laughs> yeah, yeah be, be, because the irony is, uh, you might view this as being really slow, but this is by far the most action-packed part of this film. So, so, so indeed, if you, <laughs> this is the time to get up and leave if that's too slow. <laughs> Uh, I mean, for example, you know, uh, with the jeep going back and forth, and and the train, and, and crashing into the zone, by far, this is this is James Bond practically compared to the rest of the movie. Sorry to interrupt you, but if I did, I think there's also a sort of um, uh, separation of genders that occurs in this part, where you know, uh, the women are kind of um, uh, they come in and they're dismissed, and then it becomes a man's film. Uh, J Jeff was talking earlier about how films you see can influence the way you look at the world. And uh, recently I saw the Wim Wenders documentary about Pina Bausch, mm -hmm. which has changed the way I look at everything. And one of, one of the beautiful moments in the film is there's a dancer who says that she's been, she had been dancing for Pina Bausch for years, and Pina Bausch had never said anything and never said anything. And finally she said, you just have to get crazier. 
And um, I think that there's a longing in all of us for craziness, and, and we want that in art, I think, more and more. And I think one of the reasons for me that Tarkovsky is so satisfying and beautiful is that it's pretty crazy. And it, it doesn't get any less crazy as the, as the film, but it breaks every rule of what you think art or film is, is supposed to be. Francine, as long as you were talking about breaking rules, I just, especially in this, this 15 minutes or so se that we just watched now, this segment, I was really struck by this, this uh, framing technique that Tarkovsky often uses. I think it happens more at the beginning of this film, but it's, it's in some very important moments later too, where I think, Jeff, you write about this in your book, where you don't quite know who's, who's doing the seeing, the, the framing is in an unexpected place, or for example, it moves across the outside of that wall and suddenly finds the stalker in the window, but none, no one is standing there. There's not quite a sense of who is doing the looking, and also, this really becomes important later, we always don't know why we're looking at what we're looking at. So the camera will rest meditatively on an object while something entirely unrelated is happening in the sound and in the story. I wanted to say something about the, the, the sets also and the framing because um, uh, I was struck this time with, uh, it made me think of uh, uh, Kabakov, is that the name of the Russian artist who, who uh, Kabakov. would- Kabakov. What? Kabakov. Kabakov, who, who you know, would, would set out these kinds of uh, uh, installations uh, of uh, the drab life of Soviet Russia, you know, and 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 the, there is something that's that's uh, on the borderline between film and installation art sometimes in Tarkovsky, and you see that also uh, in the set with all the water on the floor, you know. So you know, uh, it, it feels like he's 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 very influenced by that. Uh, by just looking at, at, at the set as a, as, a, as a work of art in itself, you know. And, and the way that water is always um, made to expand the, uh, the, the, the frame by, by mirroring, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just say something briefly about how um, these characters, you know, who are really, you know, they're, they're called writer and scientist and so on, we don't even get their names, but they really are classic late Soviet archetypes. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, I, I actually had the privilege of spending some time in, in, in the USSR in the late 70s, early 80s, and I sort of absorbed, I was quite young, you know, but I absorbed this Brezhnev period, ennui, or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and, I, and, and I also met some of these people from the Moscow intelligentsia. For example, this, the writer is a dead-on, practically a caricature of a number, a fusion of a number of figures who were, you know, in writers in the Moscow scene uh, in the late late 70s and and a lot you know it's interesting Jeff when I read your book you know um, and you and you mentioned in response to the writer saying um, we should write about nothing you know and then and then you went into um, a very interesting paragraph about how this is uh, reminded you of Flaubert and and so on and this is a philosophical you know and it's a completely correct observation but but another way to look at it is you know it's also a, a straight political comment you know Tarkovsky seeds this film with with such things. Um, the writer says, we should write about nothing, and he's absolutely, you know, and there's another comment um, about the truth, you know, digging for the truth, and then you discover that it's, it's, it's shit. Uh, and th this is also, you know, overt, this was, in fact, when I saw this film for the first time, I thought, how is it that they let him get away with this? You know, uh, and it's all across the film. And, and you know, I remember Ren mentioned when, when he in, in, in invited us all to this event, you know, that um, that statement at the beginning where, the, the Nobel Prize winner says something about our little country mm -hmm. was a way of sneaking it past the censors, but, but, but you know, 99.9% of, of the, certainly the Soviet uh, viewing audience saw that as irony. I mean, how else, you know, anyway. But it wasn't just, uh, he didn't just sneak it past the censors. Let's be honest, uh, Tchaikovsky was uh, uh, an object of pride for the Soviet Union. Uh, um, unlike someone like German, whose films almost never got distributed in Soviet Russia, uh, they 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 sort of uh, paraded Tarkovsky around to film festivals until he got a little out of hand. Yeah, it's it's so beautiful that the scientist is the superstitious one. Mm -hmm. You know that he's the one when the when the writer is about to go back. I mean, because obviously it's bad luck to come back when you've started on the journey. The scientist is the one who says don't do it, and then the writer says. Uh, are you really a scientist? I mean, it's one of those moments that can just go right by you, but when, you, when you're paying attention the way he makes you pay attention, you go, 
you know what else is great about the moment of don't go back is that it's such a great foreshadowing of what's about to come. I don't want to give it away to those who haven't seen, but they're going to a place where it really could be a matter of life and death, whether you step back into a room or not. You know, it's interesting. The, the, the word he uses, the, the scientist, he says, nils ya. It is not allowed. It, the, the, the subtitle was not correct. It is not allowed. That was the Soviet word, you know. Nils ya. It is not allowed. I mean, old lady said it to me all across the country, that is not allowed. What, go, what you, were you doing? Well, I, I, was, you know, I was rolling, no rolling a joint in the hermitage. No, I, I, was, uh, I, was, uh, I was too close to a painting in a hermitage, for example. It, it is not allowed, you know, over and over, that word. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I, I'm just going to give some orders here. I think, I, for one, I'm really, really interested in uh, the divergence between the subtitles we're reading and what they're actually saying. So uh, do, do please uh, more of that in the, in the parts that, that, that I are don't to even, come. I don't even speak Russian, but that word I remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, unless somebody desperately wants to, to say something, yeah, Walter, just uh, Just, uh, I, the, the sequence where we stop the film is, uh, Jeff, uh, in, in his book, Jeff describes this sequence I, I, with great uh, feeling and poetry. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a tracking sequence along, uh, as, as they move through this landscape on the, the little rail car. And just by accident, I came across a uh, review of a film made in 1897, in 1897. Uh, this is a short film called Haverstraw Tunnel, uh, shot by Billy Bitzer, who was a um, uh, famous uh, cam <coughs> Griffiths cameraman uh, for Birth of a Nation. But as a young man, he shot this film. Same thing, uh, the first tracking shot, uh, putting a camera on a train and going through a landscape. And the reviewer, who was writing for the New York Mail and Express, said, um, the way in which the unseen energy swallows up space and flings itself into the distance is as mysterious as an allegory. We hold our breath instinctively as we are swept along in the rush of the phantom cars. Our attention is held with the vice of fate. Mm. So there it was. <laughs> right, right at the oh, beginning. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I've written a, a whole uh, book about this film, uh, and I'm I'm learning an awful lot. I'm I'm having a great time. Um, so we're going to move on now, uh, and this is really uh, we stopped it there because you're now going to have one of the supreme cinematic experiences, <laughs> if you're not already having it. Uh, thank you. So we'll, uh, the, the next break won't be painful at all because it's, it's the end of part one. Thank you all. Do you know, it's so, so strange. I was talking about the subtitles being different before, but even the, the sound seems, seems different. Uh, but that's the zone. It's always changing. Um, um, one, of the, one of the nice things, uh, I think, about seeing it in a room full of people, one often under, under commented on aspect of the film becomes much more pronounced. That is to say, the comedy. Uh, it's really, really striking that it, how, how funny it is. Um, just a, a couple, of, couple of quick points. I mean, it's the power, I've seen, I mean, I really didn't think, I'd, I wasn't desperate to see this film again uh, at this moment. <laughs> Uh, the power of it is extraordinary. It's just, it's completely drawn me in again. Um, I hope at some point, I mean, the people on the panel can say what they want, but I'd love it if, um, if Walter in particular will say something about, about the sound. Um, and I'd just like to make one sort of <clears throat> technical observation, which I, I think is really key to the film. You remember that sequence where there's that burned out <clears throat> military vehicle mm -hmm. and they start walking towards it? And it's, we, it's a point of view shot, isn't it? Obviously, it's the it's somebody walking towards that, and the, we, we 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 you know we, we get closer and closer, and then gradually <clears throat> they come into view, all all three of them. So whose point of view was it? Because um, it clearly, physically, literally, couldn't have been one of those, and that's one of the ways in which we get this sense of the zone as being this 
this sentient place. Uh, and also what it means is actually that point of view is ours. We're not just watching this, this place, the zone, we are in it. We're, we're along for the ride as well. Um, I don't know. Would you like to begin, Walter, by saying something about, about the sound? Uh, sure. It's, um, uh, you know, I, I have, a, I, I guess, a, a kind of uh, temporal link with this film because uh, for all the difficulties he was having making this film, uh, Francis Coppola was simultaneously making Apocalypse Now. The, the dates of when uh, Francis started shooting in 1976, and finished in 79. This started in 77 and finished in 79. Uh, there were heart attacks in both cases. Um, Tarkovsky had a heart attack. Martin Sheen had a heart attack. Both films suffered uh, what seemed like catastrophes at the midpoint. A typhoon wrecked everything on Apocalypse Now and then this uh, with Stalker, the, um, the, the difficulty with the film stock uh, where everything had to be reconsidered, but uh, hello? in both cases um, uh, that pause gave time for, for the directors to reconsider what they were doing. Uh, there was recasting for an Apocalypse Now, the Harvey Keitel was recast with Martin Sheen, um, Stalker had a reconception of who he was, um, the, the, the scene in Apocalypse Now uh, was Francis and I got together uh, at, the, at this, he came back to San Francisco and had a discussion about here, where are we and what, what have we shot and what do we need and uh, I suggested adding a scene which uh, was the um, so, some, some point of contact as they go up River, uh, which turned into the the murder on the sampan uh, scene. Uh, both are people moving into a forbidden landscape, uh, going up river to Cambodia uh, to visit uh, some uh, mysterious uh, person to kill him. In fact, uh, here the magic of the room. So anyway, there are just lots of similarities. Um, we also had a very aggressive um, attitude toward the sound of Apocalypse Now. We, we wanted to invent a whole new way of listening to sound, which turned into uh, 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 what has become the, the 5.1 format. The standard now is the standard format for motion pictures, uh, but was not uh, unknown at the time. You mentioned in the book uh, this possibility of a, ha let's have a theater where only Stalker plays uh, just over and over again, and whenever you want to go see the film, you can go to that theater. And that was actually Francis's idea for Apocalypse Now, is that the, uh, he would build a theater in the geographic center of the United States, somewhere in Kansas, <laughs> and um, it would be a building kind of like an IMAX theater before the fact of IMAX theaters and families would come drive from all over the country like going to Mount Rushmore they'd come to see Apocalypse Now um, but we'll have to have a super sound format to make this a uh, real experience and that the, the, so the, own, the theater obviously was never built um, but the artifact of this was the sound. L listening to this soundtrack, th this has been recomposed, I think, uh, uh, by somebody else uh, in, into this 5.1 format. Uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, Tarkovsky mixed the sound like this at the beginning. What strikes me most about the sound is that it's all dubbed, um, that the dialogue is all added after the fact. Um, uh, in, in Italian cinema, that's always the case. Is that not always the case with uh, Soviet films? No, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about Soviet uh, filmmaking to know. The, the, there is a um, 
kind of a national characteristic. Uh, Italian, it's very common to dub everything, although less so now than in the old days. In France, following uh, Jean Renoir's dictum, uh, there was just the opposite. E everything had to be sync sound. Um, so I'm, I'm listening to the voices and I'm hearing this kind of everything is in the same relationship to the mm -hmm. um, to the microphone, no matter where they are uh, in the scene. There was one brief little moment where I think I heard some original dialogue, uh, just one line of dialogue, but it had a very different quality to it. Um, but uh, there is a very inventive uh, use of sound effects um, the, uh, and, and processing sound effects through synthesizers. Um, which is something we were also doing in Apocalypse Now. It was just something in the air. Uh, and of trying to fuse music and sound to make them um, cohabit uh, in a more friendly way. Um, so it's, it's uh, I, I, mm, I would say it's, it's imaginative, but technically uh, a little crude, this sound, I would say. Um, but. For me, the imaginativeness uh, carries the day. I, I would mm -hmm. much rather that than the opposite. Yeah, the music is, it strikes me how cool the music is, actually. Uh, yeah, um, it's, it's very good music. And, and not, you know, uh, it doesn't overstay its welcome. You know, there are long sections where you think, well, he would put some music in here, but uh, he doesn't. He just leaves you on your own. And I, I appreciate that uh, greatly. I just, there's one more quote here, uh, which I uh, ran across. Uh, I, I had this uh, in, in my uh, kit for a number of years, but it's another Russian. You were talking in the book about how Tarkovsky rescues the abandoned uh, uh, artifacts of humanity and, and renders them into this beautiful state of being cinematically. And this is uh, Nabokov talking from the gift. And he says, uh, you should feel a piercing pity for the tin box in a waste patch of land for the cigarette card from a series of national costumes trampled in the mud, for the poor stray word repeated by the kind-hearted, weak, loving creature who has just been scolded for nothing, for all the trash of life which by means of a momentary alchemic distillation is turned into something valuable and eternal. Oh, bollocks. We should have, we should have had this session before I finished the book. Then I could have put that in. <laughs> I was I was very conscious uh, watching this section this time, of of the ways in which uh, Tarkovsky compels you to to surrender to the film and give yourself over and and get rid of all the things you think of as logical and sensible. And in Jeff's book, you talk about um, the the nuttiness, so to speak, of the whole nuts and bandages mm -hmm. situation, and 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 the fact that no one is asking, what's up with that. Uh, <laughs> You you stop asking and 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 you're there in in that sense with them because because what you have brought to it your own logical self is is kind of dissolved by that. Um, I want to make a few random comments. One, um, how how many shots um, show us their backs? You know how much dialogue is delivered uh, with their backs to us in that Miles Davis turning away from the audience way. Um, and um, it, uh, it, it's funny, this time, I, having, having mentioned the whole aesthetic of uh, the long shot, the long duration shot, um, it seems as though he, he, he doesn't take pains to orchestrate complexly the way, let's say, Janschko or Angelopoulos would. Um, they're mostly rather simple shots that go on for a long time. Uh, and very often it seems that the figures are in the foreground. So he's not really working with that much depth of field. It's actually often a rather shallow composition, you know, with, except for kind of these, these landscape cutaways. So he's not doing that, that distanced uh, Mizuguchi thing, you know. He's, he's, he's really uh, showing us the figures close up, almost in, you know, a medium shot or a close up shot. Uh, and then um, 
And, and, and the whole thing with the backs, you know, they, they, they talk a lot. You know, there's a lot of dialogue in this scene, in this film. So it's not like a, it's not as though it's a slow, semi-silent film, you know. It's, it's really a talkie. Um, yeah, having them face away from the camera makes the dubbing easier. It does. It does make it easy. <laughs> and it does seem to me this time that, the, that all the sound is on top, coming from the same place, and that that, that is fairly unrealistic by American and French standards, as you point out. Um, I also thought about two genres uh, that that this one relates to. One is the uh, one is the horror movie where you go out into nature uh, and don't know what to expect, you know. And there's a lot in this film about nature and alienation from nature, just as there is in, in Solaris, you know. And the, the, there's so many overlaps between Solaris and and Stalker, I think, in this going to this strange place, which is a kind of, the place itself is, is sentient, as often happens in, in horror movies. And the other, of course, is the, is, is the Western, where you know, there's a sort of trek across an open landscape, you know, uh, with the feeling of ominousness always, always close by. Uh, thank you. D Donna and Michael, would you? Yeah, the, the means by which he invests the zone with that ominousness is really, it, it, it's, it's in this section that we just watched that you see it all starting to take place. The nuts and bandages that are introduced with no explanation whatsoever. That at first we think maybe, I thought at first they were being thrown for mines, maybe landmines or some actual physical danger. But it soon becomes clear that we're just in a kind of ontologically dangerous place. It's not even clear what could happen with the nuts and bandages as they land. But they're also funny. It also becomes part of the comic business that they're throwing them. So that's all beautiful. As far as the sound, I just wanted to note that the, the music, it's the, the theme to Stalker. What I think of is sort of the, the Stalker theme song kicks in in this, this part we just watched, which is that flute, that kind of eerie flute theme with the drone, Middle Eastern drone in the background. The score is by Edward Artemyev, who often composed, I think he also composed the Solaris score, I'm not sure but was a composer that worked with Tarkovsky. And there's a great interview with him that's, I believe, on the, the DVD that this comes from, because I recognize these subtitles, the, the two DVD set. And uh, the composer interview is just incredible. He talks about what it's like to work with Tarkovsky. He also had to scrap his entire score because he wrote something that Tarkovsky decided was wrong. So once again, as with the film, he had to begin from zero. And, uh, and he talks about how he and Tarkovsky had long talks about the, the, the concept of the film before he started to compose. And one of the things Tarkovsky said is that he didn't think music should function as lining. That was his word. Music shouldn't be the lining of a film, which I, which I thought was really great. And so the music in this film, I think, it, it isn't a lining. It isn't just reinforcing whatever we're seeing on screen. I think it's, it's creating a whole other world. It's strangely Eastern in a way. There's something a little Eastern about the score, including the Definitely. orchestration. And it, it's, it's very striking. It's a beautiful theme. Actually, it's interesting, Jeff. You, um, I learned something new from uh, one of the things I learned new from your book was that the in original intention was to shoot the film in, so in Soviet Central Asia, which I had no idea about. It's fascinating. Maybe that's one reason that you had this this uh, mm -hmm. Eastern feeling. Um, I would just say a couple of things, um, uh, and they're kind of personal. I mean, in a sense, um, my two favorite shots, kind of short shots in Tarkovsky. Um, that illustrate his basic idea, one of his basic ideas was that you should see time unfolding within a, a shot. And of course, you know, with these long elaborate takes, of course you see time unfolding and so forth, but, but sometimes in a much more kind of, in a smaller way, in a smaller scale way, you see that. And you know, that moment when, when the stalker lies face down in the, in the zone soil, you know, and, and it's as if he's returning to his lover, you know, um, is fantastic. But, but the, the moment that really gets me is when that little inchworm yeah. inches yeah. across yeah. his right. finger. It's a bit like sort of blue velvet or... <laughs> blue, oh, yeah, how so? Isn't there that scene where they come across the, the hand? With a bug crawls into ear. an ear. The ear. Mm -hmm. the, ear. the ear, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, although, um, yeah, in, in some ways, yeah. But anyway, that... <laughs> I'm being diplomatic. No. Point um, taken, sorry. That inchworm, somehow, you know, he, Tarkovsky, I bet he put it there, I would like to know. But he it lets was, it... It was added by Lucas and CGI. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. But by the way, the other, the other short, brief kind of illustration of that idea in Tarkovsky's films is in, in, in the film called The Mirror, you have this very interesting scene where Ignat, who's the young, basically the actor playing the young Tarkovsky, suddenly sees a middle-aged woman in this room who asks him to read something from a book. She just appears like an apparition. 
and she has a cup of tea on the top of a piano, if I remember correctly. And he reads this letter from Pushkin uh, to uh, another writer about Russia and how the, the, um, the Enlightenment passed Russia. And it was really about Russia, but, but he would not change Russia for anything else and so on. And Ignat reads this, and he turns around, and, and the woman has gone, and her cup of tea has gone, and you see a shot of condensation, a circle of condensation evaporating on the top of the piano. And it never fails to, you know, hairs rise on my arms when I see this shot. It's just so powerful. Um, the other thing I would say you know, about this sequence, this particular part of the film, is the what is the first thing you see when, when we kick into color? Does anybody remember? The first thing you see? The cross? Cross-shaped, cross-shaped uh, telegraph poles, you know. And, and Tarkovsky was not really given to overt symbolism in general, and, and, and he would be probably furious with me for bringing up such a thing, but I, it's not unintentional. But this is a film where somebody wears a crown of thorns. <laughs> Later, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's true. a spoiler. That's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but also, it's three of them. you got these three, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. anyway. I, I, I don't want to go into, you know, I, I don't have anything more to say. Than, I don't have any more analysis than that, but it, it's something, it's kind of interesting, I would say, that he does it. Could I just say the most obvious thing? It probably doesn't need saying. But, um, but when it switches from sepia into color, it makes, it's so shockingly beautiful that, mm -hmm. that it makes you feel as if you've never seen a color film before mm -hmm. and that no one has ever seen or made a color film. I mean, you're, it really makes you see it as if for the first time, which is pretty miraculous. That is, that is so true. Um, and let me just get this straight around. Are they allowed to go to the restroom now? <laughs> uh, you are indeed allowed to go to the restrooms. We're, we're going to take a 15 minute break, but not without first uh, thanking our panelists. Uh, uh, while the other members of the, the panel are coming up here, just a bit of um, a few points. Uh, we at the Institute of the Humanities are always hoping to improve your experience. So if we do this again, we're going to get you to sit there in soaking wet coats so that you can have a, a fully immersive experience. Um, I'll just, I forgot to mention something at the beginning. Uh, we talked, Walter particularly was talking about the, uh, the problems in the, the history of making the film. And uh, those continued, in a way, after it was finished. The first time the film was broadcast on TV in Britain, um, they, somebody obviously sort of saw the first bit of it, and they thought it was a black and white film, and so they broadcast the whole film in black and white. Uh, the transition to colour never happened, so effectively they never made it to, to the zone, but that's the, that's the kind of country I come from. <laughs> um, it's really, it's just so, so striking to me how, I mean, it's just incredible how much, it reminds me, of, apparently when Kafka used to read his stories to his friends, they'd all sit around howling with laughter. So that's something, that the, the, the comedy of it is, is, is increased. But also, I mean, I think as it, as it goes on, one becomes more struck by, by, by certain things. Um, Obviously, many people have commented on the way that, in some ways, it was a prophetic film that, you know, Tarkovsky anticipated Chernobyl, all this sort of thing. But it's also uh, backward-looking as well, isn't it? It's, it's clearly not a film uh, about the gulag, but it's a film that is haunted by the gulag. The gulag is there constantly in this word zona, in the, I mean, the, 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 the stalker's hair, you know, he's got that zek, zek haircut. I think that becomes much more pronounced as the, as the film goes on. Uh, a final point before I hand over. Um, when I was <clears throat> going through the proofs of the book, on the, the fourth, uh, f I think I was going through the proofs for the fourth time, I noticed something so important during that last scene that, uh, that I had to make a, a big change. Did you, did you notice where the camera went? After they'd all been, uh, after the sort of long bum fight sequence, uh, and when you know, the, uh, after the the writer is nearly accident, did you did, did you notice where the camera went? Yeah, it's just incredible that. I mean, none of the humans uh, make it into the room, but the camera goes into the room, and by implication, the camera has its deepest wish realised which is basically that this film came into existence against all odds. Um, I know, I'm sure everybody wants to talk about the dog. Um, 
Uh, who would like to go first? Francine, maybe. We, uh. I thought the dog was a wolf till I read your book. <laughs> so, um, I, I, speaking of your book, I, I had a thought about this section of the film, and then I couldn't remember if it was my thought or if I read it in your book. So I'm just going to say it, and those of you who've read the book will be hearing it again. Um, and, and that is that there are these three moments, and, and the first is when Stalker is talking about um, music and the generosity of art and the beauty of music. And then, and then when the writer is in the meat mincer talking about the horror of his life and art. And then a little later when Stalker is talking about why he brings them, people to the zone. And I thought, oh, obviously Tarkovsky is just having this big argument with himself about art and about making art. And it's the sort of argument that anyone who's trying to do it has in the middle of the night all the time. And, and, but I'd never seen it on a, on a screen before or done so beautifully and, 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 and not obviously about that, except it is about that. Mm -hmm. Was that in your book? Um, I can't quite remember, actually. <laughs> I, almost certain it's all, everything is in the book. <laughs> it's the key to all mythologies. Um, um, I had a um, comment about the prophetic nature of the, you know, the zone and Chernobyl. Um, and there's no doubt that um, there's a prophetic quality, and we had a zone later. But one thing that, um, to this day, a lot of people don't recognize in the West is that there was a major nuclear accident in, uh, near the town of Chelyabinsk in 1957 when um, they... By the way, this, speaking of zones, this was in a closed zone of the Soviet Union where researchers like our scientists were working. And um, so no foreigners were allowed there. Um, there were closed cities and all, and all of that. And uh, they were doing nuclear production there and just simply pouring plutonium, all kinds of highly radioactive substances into storage tanks uh, just underground. And one of them blew up. And apparently there was a genuine mushroom cloud. It spread all kinds of uh, nasty stuff all over the landscape. And, um, uh, and then there, a zone was created in the late, this is two decades before this film. Mm -hmm. And Soviet citizens knew about this, but it was highly uh, uh, confidential. And, and, they, and they were not, you, you simply didn't talk about it. There, people would talk about it quietly at home. But Soviet citizens knew about it. Mm -hmm. And so, so this whole, um, Early in the film, when we hear about the zone, you know, monkey and how she's a victim of the zone, um, a good friend of mine in Moscow uh, who was, took me around uh, when I was writing for Rolling Stone in the mid-80s about Russian underground culture, um, was born uh, near Chelyabinsk uh, a year later, and he was a giant. He, I mean, he is a giant. He's got in all the features of giantism, big forehead and so on. And we talked about this and he said, yeah, you know, he said with, you know, very good humored way, he said, I'm, I'm a genetic hiccup. So he was a zone child, mm -hmm. you know, let's say. Um, so that's one thing that um, I just wanted to say about that because I don't think Tarkov, you know, Tarkovsky, there are many kinds of zones, you know, obviously. And he, I don't think he meant directly that thing. Obviously, we're talking about a place where your innermost wish is granted, not a nuclear waste mm. site. Um, but um, I did want to bring that up. And then another thing I would say about this particular section we just watched is, um, you know, when the phone rings, you know, and it's the wrong number, this is another great Russian joke, Soviet joke. Um, but, but then when you, after he speaks to his colleague, um, you know, and it becomes clear that something strange is going on, and then the writer says, what, what is going on with you? And they have this little dialogue. And then at one point the writer says, you know, you might get your Nobel and everything, Within a couple sentences later, he says, you know, you, you, you think you'll get one thing, but you'll get another kind of thing entirely. And, and this is the same decade when Sakharov, Andrei Sakharov, the father of the Soviet H-bomb, got a Nobel Peace Prize, not a Nobel Prize for Physics, you know. And I'm not saying that that's direct, you know, but it was definitely in the air, let's say. You know, this kind of, um, these kinds of characters were there in, mm -hmm. in actually... Sakharov was then in a closed zone. He was, he was exiled to Gorky um, because of his, his actions to try to stop Soviet um, you know, atmospheric tests and so forth. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Philip, we, I mean, if, um, Philip well, you, you don't have to speak. If, 
but you were, you were, you I'll just right. say two things. One, I, I completely agree with Francine that the film gets wilder and wilder. Uh, it's so it's so Russian, you know. They just sit around talking about their wasted lives, um, <laughs> and uh, so of course that's the that's the Chekhovian element, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, sometimes I resist Tarkovsky. Uh, you know, I just get to that point, and then I, I think, well, you know, um, I'm not sure the writing is good enough to 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 go toe to toe with Chekhov, uh, <laughs> and and so it, it it sometimes I feel like there's a lot of of bluster, and uh, I I like the fact that that scene slows down so much. Mm. And there we are. We're stuck, you know. Um, but 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 I feel uh, uh, pummeled and bullied sometimes, and uh, and so I just want to record my skepticism and yeah. resistance. Yeah, yeah. No, it, <laughs> it, it it it. That's the that that big chunk. I mean, I I find that does you know my my attention sags a bit in that, and I think it's a really good point that some of the some of the writing is, is pretty weak. I think in in that sequence. I, all I would say is that the, the great power of the section we just watched, I think, is the audacity of the transitions, just how audacious they get, and there ceases to be any attempt at all to explain why the, the, the dry tunnel that isn't a dry tunnel leads back to the place that it began, or how the meat mincer leads into the room with the hillocks of dust in it, and that all of those spaces just have their own being in such a kind of bold way. And I think that's actually is my favorite section of the film that we just saw, not really because of anything to do with the, the bickering between science and art and all the allegory in the dialogue, which I, I agree gets a little heavy, but because of just the, the, the visual audacity and the kind of conceptual audacity mm -hmm. of, of all of those, those spaces that are established one after another and that all seem to flow from some strange internal logic. Yeah, I love it when he goes to the door and suddenly you realize he's going to have to wade through this a pool of water, you know. And the knapsack over the head, which you write about in the book, I love that they, they, they shout out again to the knapsack that was so dear to the professor. And of course, at the end, you realize it's because he had his bomb in it. But it's almost as if his thermos and his sandwiches meant just as yeah, much to him. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, by the way, sorry, I forgot to say there's a new book about Tarkovsky coming out by Nariman Shakov, who um, uh, teaches at Stanford. And he points out that during that sequence when they're all having that sort of uh, rather rather damp pillow talk, um, <laughs> and it zooms in on Professor as he listens. And if you look very closely at the shiny buttons on the Professor's coat, mm. you can see a reflection of the lights and the camera and the cameraman. Mm. That is deep stalker geekhood, isn't it? <laughs> In fact, shall we play that whole section all over again, just so you can, uh, you can see that? Uh, Mr. Merch. Well, I, I was just um, reminded, when, when we began this section, it was because it was part two, um, that there was, in a sense, this, uh, as you say in the book, this, this hiccup of an intermission that just gives us a kind of a, it's like your hard drive is starting up again. Um, and uh, films at this time in the, in the 70s uh, were making a transition. Um, when we were doing The Godfather, uh, it was just assumed that there would be an intermission in the film because it was three hours long. And you didn't make long films without putting an intermission in it because of people's bladders and because of the theater owners wanting to sell more popcorn and because it was a tradition. And um, in fact, in The Godfather, we, we had uh, created an intermission right after the killing of Salazzo and McCluskey. Um, and uh, then at, at one point, Bob Evans, who was the head of the studio, uh, came in and said, we're not going to have an intermission. Uh, the film is too strong. We don't want to let them off the hook. Mm. And so we took it out, uh, you know, as a strict intermission. You can still see sort of the, uh, the echo of it. it uh, the car drives off and music comes in uh, very strong. And then there's a transition to a, a lighter thing. And um, 
It, it's just it's it's a historical curiosity, really, that uh, we we made that transition th during the 1970s, mm. um, and now people don't even think about doing that anymore. As, uh, whereas at that time, it was just it was part of the just the the grammar of making a long film was to was to put an intermission in, into it. Uh, 2001 you. had an intermission uh, in the late. 60s. That was true of all Italian movies of a certain length. They would always be part one and then part two. They'd always have an intermission. Well, uh, I guess so. this is the moment when I have to compliment you all on your bladders. It's really, you're just holding out so well. Um, and as I say, we've only got maybe 15 minutes to go. Uh, and then at the end of that, we'll, uh, we'll deliver our summings up. And then, of course, you can, you can have your say. Uh, if your minds have not been blown yet by this film, uh, you, I offer a full guarantee that they will be with the, the, next, uh, the, the next and last segment. That, that sequence when we f see Monkey's head uh, in, in, in the headscarf and we assume, sh uh, we assume she's walking and then we see that she's being carried on her dad's uh, shoulders. It is, I think that is one of the most profound moments that you're in any, in any work of art. Uh, and then that last, uh, that last sequence with the, the telekinetic moving of the glasses, it just sends shivers up, 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 up up one spine, so let me hand over to the, to the panel. I want to know why, why does a monkey on his shoulders oh, really I, I, do I, it for you? Why is she on his shoulders? I guess because she can't, she can't no, no, walk. No, 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 just why, why is that moment one of the most profound in any work of art to you? Oh, uh, oh God, um, it, no, it just, because it, um, it gets to me so deeply, and I think it's that, uh, uh, the, oh, it just looks so beautiful with the headscarf. Um, yeah, it's just in terms of its sort of its inexhaustible power. I think for for me, does it not does it not do it for you? I think it's a uh, it's a play on um, on Dreyer's or Odette. You know how in Odette the dead woman uh, comes to life, and you have to just trust that uh, it's a miracle because you're seeing it in front of your eyes. So in this case. The, it's a negative miracle. The miracle doesn't happen. Oh, yeah. Superb. Yeah, that's it. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I, you, Philip. You know, I think there's uh, a, a couple of interesting things to consider here. One is that the film is so uh, constructed uh, that it can open itself up to all kinds of interpretations over a long period of time, which is a good signifier of something that can endure as, as a work of art. You, you can analyze the film from n knowing Soviet history of the time and it will resonate, it will, it will accept that. Uh, but then you can also just uh, look at it as a question uh, that are generally posed to human beings on Earth, which is why are we here? And uh, what is life all about? What are we supposed to do? Uh, what is dangerous? What is not? Um, what is responsibility? Um, and it will accept all of these uh, these things as well. Um, I, I'm I'm put in mind of a, a film I saw. Uh, I think it was a, it was a television. Uh, program about filmmakers and the films that inspired them. And there was one uh, program which was dedicated to Marty Scorsese. This was, this was probably about 15 years ago, I think. And uh, he was talking in his Scorsese intense way about, kind of like uh, Jeff is talking, uh, about a film that deeply influenced him. And... Uh, uh, the more he talked, the more you just, you wanted to see this thing that had so deeply stamped Marty with this open-hearted realization of the potentials of cinema. And then, in fact, after uh, a long digression uh, from him, they did show the scene that he was talking about. They cut to the scene, and my reaction was, what? <laughs> you saw that in that? Uh -huh. um, so there's, a, there's an element of that here 
Um, and and no, very very politely put. And and Jeff talks uh, quite openly about this. Uh, and and this is, you know, it's re it's really a, a interesting, peculiar thing, which is the dynamics between an audience uh, and uh, let's say an audience of one and film, but it could be any work of art, but we're talking about film, which is that uh, film is a language, it, it's a way of communicating, very complex uh, system of signs and signifiers and t use of time. And at a certain point in your life, Jeff was 22 when he saw this film, you are primed for a revelation of some kind. And something is likely to happen and some film is likely to trigger that realization. It could be Stalker, it could be When Eagles Dare. Um, but it, for Jeff, prompting this book, it was Stalker. And so that the opening up is something that's happening within Jeff that finds places to attach itself, just as I was saying about this film being open to so many different interpretations. So the film is worthy of being the can opener that opens up your w a new way of looking at the world for you. Um, but the other point that Jeff makes is that this then becomes less accessible to subsequent generations, that there's, that there's a moment for a film and an audience where there is a really powerful interaction because of what's come before or because of what has not come before and that suddenly happens when you watch this film. And it does open up a whole new way of being and people get very excited about it and that excitement endures. Um, future generations uh, look and say like, what? <laughs> um, so he, Jeff uh, makes the point that uh, for him it was stalker, for, uh, but he looked at breathless and goes, what? <laughs> and the next generation looks at this, they who have been uh, influenced by Reservoir Dogs, and they look at this and go, what? Uh, so there's a, there's a anyway, there's, there's a very complicated dynamic which has uh, gone into nicely in, in the book of how a work of art can, can influence people and what we read into the work and what is actually there. Thank you. Um, that's interesting you say that because um, I just wanted to report some <laughs> little family story, which is uh, when my son was seven, you know, and was already deep into the Cartoon Network <laughs> aesthetic of, of, of Cartoon Network uh, and fast cuts and all that stuff, you know, um, uh, and didn't yet read uh, very well. And, um, I, you know, I, I happened to have Stalker on a laptop, not unlike that laptop. And, and I said to him, I was just kind of trying to experiment, I said, you know, with this film, it's by the great Russian director Tarkovsky, it doesn't really matter, but, you know, the, the premise of the film is you have to get through a bunch of obstacles and so forth, and in the center of this zone, which appeared after something mysterious happened, there's a room, and if you get to that room, then your innermost wish is granted, granted to you. And he listened, and he was very interested, you know, and he said, well, I'd like to see it, you know, and I opened the thing, and I thought I would, he would, I would get 10 minutes before he said, okay, Cartoon Network time. He watched the entire thing straight oh. through. This is a film in Russian, which he didn't understand, with subtitles he couldn't read. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he was just completely fascinated. Uh, and, then, yeah. and then, you know, d d you know, just to finish the story, then about two weeks later, we were on a Croatian island called Loshin. <laughs> and um, um, I should explain, I lived in Slovenia for years. My son is bilingual in Slovenian and English, but he doesn't speak Russian. Um, and he invited his friend over. Uh, and the two of them watched the film again. <laughs> you know, straight through. Two seven-year-olds uh, lying, actually lying <laughs> together. It was the cutest scene. Lying on a bed with the laptop open in front of them, watching straight through. Because well, he explained right. to his friend, they had to, you have to get to this room, and then your innermost. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I felt like there's hope, you know, somehow. <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I've thought a lot about why the last scene just kills me, which it doesn't, and it's partly because it feeds into several of my own obsessions, and, and I think when art really gets to you, often it's, it's for that reason. One of the obsessions is uh, Russian icon painting, and the other is obviously telekinesis. Um, uh, 
I, the way I came to Tarkovsky, I'd never heard of him, but I was a huge fan of icon painting, and someone said to me, well, he's made this movie, Andre Rublev, about an icon painter. And I, can't, I think it was in San Francisco, and I think I went and saw it like every night for a week. And I, I was just, you know, I couldn't get over it. And, and when I look at, at, at Stalker, and particularly at the first shot of Monkey in her headscarf, it's like an icon, it's like a moving yeah, icon, yeah. and he's mm -hmm. like showing you one icon after another. Mm. Then telekinesis, uh, around the time that I, f I think I first saw Stalker, it was made around the same time as this film called Time of the Gypsies by Kusterica, in which uh, telekinesis is, is a big kind of plot point. And, um, and I've always been interested in, and I had been even as a kid, trying to move things uh, Mentally, it, it, it didn't work. Can you do it now? <laughs> no, I never, I never could. But, uh, but the, other, the other day I was talking to a friend of mine, and I was saying, I was trying to describe what it was about the film that moved me, and I said, well, it has a great telekinesis. It actually has two of them. I, at the beginning, when, the, when the, the glass rattles on the table, mm. it never occurred to me until much later that it was the train going by. I just, I somehow automatically assumed. Anyway, um, monkey is telekinesis. It's, I, I was telling a friend of mine about it, and she said, well, what is telekinesis? And I said, well, it's when you think about something and you move it by thinking about it. And she said, oh, well, that's what it means to make a film. <laughs> and I thought, oh, bingo. Yeah. <laughs> finally, um, uh, 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 finally on the subject of monkey, everyone's saying all through the film, she's damaged, she's damaged, she's damaged, she's ruined by the zone. And in fact, maybe she can't walk. I mean, she does have legs. We've heard she doesn't. She does, in fact, have legs. But maybe she's damaged, but she can move things with her mind, mm -hmm. which is something else. So here he's gone all the way through the zone and done this thing, which is apparently or supposedly produced a subnormal child and has, in fact, produced an extra normal child or a superior child in, in some essential way. So. Um, so that's a little part of why I love that f scene so much. Great. You see, be, Donna? <laughs> is she meant to be an ominous child in any way, do you think? This is in your book, too. And I know I, s some people have read the ending as a sort of slouching toward Bethlehem kind of moment as, as you mm -hmm. hear Ode to Joy on the train. And it's so strange. The ending of this film is so strange. I mean, the whole film is so strange, of course. But all the rest of it, to me, can somehow fit into some coherent aesthetic whole. But every time I've seen it, this is the third time I've seen it only. Unlike some of you, I haven't been seeing it, you know, my whole life, although I did first see it, I think, 20 years ago or so. But I always think the film's going to end at that moment that we just saw, that where we stopped it last time, where the camera mm, pulls into yeah. the room and the rain comes down. And in fact, the film could end right there and be a, a perfect, sort of completed work of art. And the coda has just always baffled me completely. It's, it's, it's chilling and it's beautiful, but I, I don't understand it at all. And I would love to hear anyone's interpretation of what Monkey and Beethoven and everybody is up to. I sort of feel it, it, <laughs> it would be so weird. I mean, it's that, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't remember who wrote the, wrote the story where he says that he finds her very, very sinister and a sort of antichrist figure or something. And that seems so perverse, really, because it seems surely it's got to be a compensatory thing for the damage done to her physically. but by the zone, and I don't, although the dog is whimpering because something strange is going on, um, it feels to me like a, a sort of religious and redemptive moment rather than a... A miracle. It's a, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Yeah. And it's about the future in some way, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. because it's a child and the onrushing train, there's something about it that's about what comes next, what comes after the next generation after the zone. And it's, and it's the ultimate what he's brought back from the zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the lovely doggy that he's brought back. Yeah, uh, I mean, and, and, yeah. and it's that nicely bar balanced paradox which uh, he gets into when he's uh, lying there talking to his wife, and she says, don't you think I would have something to wish for? <laughs> um, as does, does he. And, and here, the, 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 this little conundrum of, is the zone in some way responsible for what happened to monkey, but mm -hmm. if it is, then why isn't the room the solution to that problem? Yeah, why don't yeah. they? Why doesn't he go into the room, or take his wife in there and say, "Please make monkey whole again"? Yeah. Um, because of this, the other thing about the wish is that it doesn't give you what you say you want; it gives you what is deep within you, 
which you may not know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're afraid to go into the room to, to confront that issue. Uh, and yet, out of this whole uh, spiral of, of wishes and being afraid of wishes, Monkey does, uh, out of all of this, she does have an ability, the telekinetic ability, which in some way, in a kind of religious, mysterious way, compensates for the imagined uh, trouble that she has, which is never really specified either. Mm -hmm. Yep, we'll hear from Philip, and then have we got time for some questions after Philip, Laura? Too late, okay, Philip, the last word. Oh, too bad in the last word, because I, I'm, I'm a non-believer. Uh, I'm one of those writers and intellectuals with the dead eyes that they were talking about at the end. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so, except, um, that, except that when you see the other side of the room, you see that yes. it's loaded with books. Yeah, well, yeah. You know. yes. But I think that, I, but I, I interpreted that scene where uh, uh, the stalker is, is shivering and, uh, and ra raving about the, the lack of belief, you know, um, as um, in a way ambiguous in that uh, I think Tarkovsky was having his cake and eating it too in that there's a part the, there's just a suggestion that actually this guy is delusional and that the zone doesn't exist uh, as, as certainly as a, a grantor of wishes um, and you know he's he you know he's he's not going to be able to bring people back there because nobody believes in it you know but, so but he did bring back the dog yeah and he, color well, he brought back the dog, but I don't think that was his innermost wish. But anyway, um, so I think, I, think that, I think that in a way, Tarkovsky, the, the, the Christian Tuck and Tarkovsky was saying, you know, believe, believe, like, you know, in Peter Pan. And, and, um, and the, the skeptic was saying, maybe it's all a delusion. And so in the end, he, he leaves the audience with hope. But I, I prefer uh, the first version. Okay, um, Ren is going to say a, a few words just to let you know because I, I feel you haven't had enough Tarkovsky today. Um, so tomorrow we're showing Mirror at the Museum of the Moving Image. And then on Monday, uh, I'll be speaking at the School of Visual Arts, and we'll be doing this nice thing. I'll be reading some passages from the book, and it'll be synced in with some sections of, of, of the film. So uh, if you haven't had enough of Tarkovsky, and I know you haven't had enough of me, see you again on Monday. And here's Ren, who we thank very much. Fantastic. I'm sorry about not taking questions from the audience, but we actually have to clear the hall relatively quickly. So as you leave, leave quickly. But not. I just also want to say that that uh, we do these things pretty regularly. Go to our website, nyihumanities.org. Uh, sign up, and you'll hear about more of them. Uh, and uh, this this turned out we had our cake and ate it too. We got to see the movie, and we had, and this worked. Yeah. Uh, we, we were talking backstage about possibly doing it with a James Bond movie next year. Um, <laughs> But anyway, thank you all so much. You were a terrific audience, and we've had a great time.